Section 3. The story of food, not bombs. Every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket fired signifies, in the final sense, a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and are not clothed. Dwight D. Eisenhower, April 16th, 1953. This is the story of food, not bombs, from my perspective. There could be at least eight other stories about the founding of Food Not Bombs and many thousands of additional accounts, detailing the many events in our history in the 30-year story of our movement. After originally writing the book Food Not Bombs, How to Feed the Hungry and Build Community in the Third Person, I decided it would be more honest to tell this account in. First Person. Food Not Bombs is a decentralized, non-hierarchical movement involving thousands of people, all of whom have been touched personally by their experience with Food Not Bombs. Who am I to write the official history of Food Not Bombs? I can only write the history from my own perspective. The First Food Not Bombs Chapter. One crisp fall evening in 1976 at Boston University, Professor Howard Zinn finished his American history class with details about the Public Service Company of New Hampshire and their plans to build a nuclear power station on a tiny marsh in the town of Seabrook. Professor Zinn was one of many New Englanders who were speaking out against the power station at town meetings, organizing marches and signing petitions, but the construction started. Local activists organized the Clamshell Alliance to mobilize the public to stop the project. I was inspired by Professor Zinn's passion and arguments against the nuclear power station, so I started to volunteer with the Clamshell Alliance in 1976. Soon marches became, blockades and direct actions became occupation attempts in October 1979 through May 1980. The eight of us who started Food Not Bombs were united by the events of May 2004, 1980. On that sunny spring day, over 4,000 activists with the Coalition for Direct Action at Seabrook made an attempt to occupy the, grew the collective that started Food Not Bombs. Therefore, this attempted occupation of Seabrook on May 24, 1980 marks the beginning of the Food Not Bombs movement. Police use water cannons to protect. Seabrook Nuclear Power Station. Seabrook Nuclear Power Generating Station, with the intent of non-violently stopping construction by putting their bodies in front of the bulldozers. As affinity groups cut holes in the fence surrounding the construction site, clouds of stinging tear gas filled the air. National Guard troops rushed through the fence, beating everyone they could. Helicopters hovered above as the activists struggled to occupy the site. The next day, Boston University law student Brian Feigenbaum was arrested for assaulting a police officer, allegedly hitting him with a grappling hook. Concerned about Brian's legal problems, a core group of about 30 activists, including myself, formed to support his legal defense. Out of this effort. To raise money for Brian's legal defense, the collective set up literature tables and sold baked goods outside of Boston University and in Harvard Square, but sales were slow. An idea emerged that street theater might help. We had a poster that stated, It will be a great day when our schools get all the money they need and the Air Force has to hold a bake sale to buy a bomber. We bought military uniforms at an Army surplus store, set the poster next to our table, and pretended to be generals trying to sell baked goods to buy a bomber. While we didn't sell many brownies and cookies, we did talk to many people about Brian's case and the risks of nuclear power. Eventually, Brian's charges were dropped for lack of evidence, and our collective had discovered a great way to organize. With Brian free, the collective decided to organize its first protest to get the message across that the financial backing of Seabrook had links to the First National Bank of Boston. Many of the same people who were on the board of the bank, which was financing the nuclear power station, were also on the board of the utility that decided to buy the nuclear station, and many also sat on the board of the construction com. Food Not Bombs Table in Brattle Square, Cambridge in 1980 with Jesse Constable, Mira Brown, C.T. Lawrence Butler, and Keith McHenry. Brian Feigenbaum and Joe Swanson lead March to Draper Lab in Cambridge, Massachusetts on August 6, 1981, Penny Building It. To the activists, this looked like the business practices that resulted in the Great Depression. To protest the bank's decision to pour money into this risky investment, we again used street theater. We planned to dress as Depression-era hobos and set up a soup line outside the bank's annual stockholders meeting at the Federal Reserve Bank at South Station. The night before, worried that we might not have enough people to have a soup line, I went to the Pine Street Inn, the largest homeless shelter downtown, to talk with the homeless about the protest and invited them for lunch. The next day, we set up a soup kitchen in the plaza outside the Federal Reserve Bank, where the board meeting was being held, and, to our surprise, over 50 homeless people joined us for lunch. Many stockholders expressed anger, and some laughed at the protesters. However, the people that lived on the streets excitedly talked with the servers. We invited the public to join us at lunch. Many people stopped, had a bite to eat, and talked with one another about the reasons for the protest. Many took the flyers and expressed support. It was an exhilarating day. While cleaning the pots and pans, my friends and I decided that distributing food could be a great way to organize for peace, the environment, and social justice. We agreed to quit our jobs, rent a house, and start using food to organize. It wasn't long before we had rented a house together at 195 Harvard Street and started a regular network of food collection and distribution sites. We picked up muffins and bread at bakeries, produce and tofu at natural food stores, and surplus stock from the food co-ops. Each weekday, within hours of collecting the food, we delivered it to battered women's shelters, alcoholic rehabilitation centers, immigrant support centers, and, once a week, to most of the housing projects in Cambridge, Somerville, and several in Boston. One of our deliveries was to a dilapidated housing project near our home in Cambridge. Very thin children sat with their mothers on the steps of the projects in the shadow of a modern glass tower that housed Draper, laboratory where they were designing the guidance systems for intercontinental nuclear missiles. 
After making our deliveries, our collective cooked vegan meals, and, with our radical literature, much of which was overstocked from a job moving the New England Free Press, we took it to Harvard Square to share. Our Food Not Bombs table became a little town, hall, where people expressed their ideas and became involved in discussions about current events. On summer evenings, we brought giant puppets and set up two full drum sets that our friends Bobby and Sue would play, attracting large crowds and introducing the public to the wars in Central America and Reagan policies which redirected resources towards military programs, like Star Wars and the MX missile system. The nights were spent spray painting graffiti for peace. Themes included stencils of nuclear mushroom clouds with the word today and white outlines of dead bodies which became the basis for the nationwide shadow project. Outside grocery stores, we painted the slogan, Money for Food, Not Bombs. Eventually, this was shortened and became the name of our group. One of the first flyers, published in 1981 by the founders, ended with the words, the next few years could profoundly change the world for generations. And Food Not Bombs is working to make those changes positive for everyone. The understanding that the world is at a critical time in history and that average working people have the responsibility to make the world a better place is a true today asset was when Food Not Bombs started. In the first two years, Food Not Bombs focused on its literature and food tables, bulk food distribution, and building momentum for the June 12, 1982 action, March for Nuclear Disarmament in New York City. Leading up to this event, Food Not Bombs co-sponsored, with the Cambridge City Council, three marches against nuclear arms. On Hiroshima Day, I burned the Boston phone book to dramatize that everyone listed would burn in a nuclear attack. In the fall of 1981, I designed the Food Not Bombs logo with a carrot and purple fist. The first banner hung above the table at a Halloween evening protest against Vice President George H.W. Bush, who was giving a speech at MIT. During this time, one of the most complex events the Food Not Bombs collective organized was the Free Concert for Nuclear Disarmament at Senat Park in Cambridge in May of 1982. There was plenty of free food for everyone, and bands representing the ethnic mixture of Cambridge performed. There was an area with activities for kids of all ages called the Land of the Younger Self. Artists, craftspeople, and local peace and justice groups had tables. It was a great success and another magical day for food, not bombs. Over the next several years, the Food Not Bombs Collective also helped organize direct actions to end the war in El Salvador, including one where 500 people were arrested for holding a town meeting in the lobby of the Boston Federal Building. Food Not Bombs co-founder Mira Brown was with Ben Linder in Nicaragua when he was killed by US-funded Contra death squads. Our group also participated at a sit-in at the federal court against the draft, and we organized the Boston Pea Party, a protest against drug testing which was mentioned in Abby Hoffman's book, Steal This Drug Test. Another action Food Not Bombs helped organize was a protest against a weapons bazaar at the Howard Johnson 57 Hotel in downtown Boston. This was an event where U.S.-based corporations promoted the sale of weapons to the military of other countries. This particular one featured chemical weapons that were eventually sold to Iraq and used by Saddam Hussein on the Kurds and Iranians. During the first half of the 1980s, Boston Food Not Bombs continued collecting hundreds of pounds of surplus food every day. During the week, we would distribute it to area housing projects, progressive social service agencies, battered women's shelters, and hunger relief agencies. These groups would receive this food once a week and be responsible for distributing it to their community. In the afternoons and weekends, Food Not Bombs would cook the food, making vegan meals and setting up our table in Harvard Square, and at rallies, protests, conferences, and meetings. Anywhere activists gathered, we served free food, distributed literature, and collected donations. The marketing scheme, the Pepsi Challenge, showed up one day next to the Food Not Bombs table at Brattle Square, setting up a tent and sharing flat Coke and fizzy Pepsi to blindfolded college students. A dentist donated a case of small paper cups to Food Not Bombs. Someone added brochures about the Coca-Cola company hiring death squads against labor organizers in Guatemala to the literature displayed for visitors. Fruit was put aside, and Food Not Bombs started the Tofu Challenge offering small cups of tofu smoothies. There is more nutrition in this cup of tofu smoothie than all the Pepsi products in the world. The tofu challenge came to an end when the angry Pepsi employees pulled down their tent, packed up the soft drinks, and rushed away yelling obscenities at the Food Not Bombs activists. The Boston Red Sox had a winning year in 1986. The Kenmore Square Business Association asked me to take a picture of a local black man they passed each morning on their way to work. We want you to make a poster using his photo with a red circle and line across his face under the title, Wanted, out of Kenmore Square. I suggested the association try other strategy. I could share free meals in one of the empty buildings on Landon Street before each game. Maybe this would reduce the number of people panhandling. There isn't any way we could drive away Mr. Butch and his friends. After all, his nickname is the mayor of Kenmore Square, and Red Sox fans love him. When the Red Sox returned to Fenway for the American League playoffs, Food Not Bombs organized a welcome to Kenmore Square dinner in the park on Commonwealth Avenue. Greeting the fans and sharing vegan meals with Mr. Butch and the other people that called the Reeds and Bushes along the fence home. The association was not pleased and encouraged its members to end their business relationship with my company. Soon, we were evicted from our office and apartment, so my then-wife, Andrea, and I packed up our personal belongings and drove south with our pets. Eric Weinberger and those left behind continued to share meals and literature throughout the Boston area. Eric worked for peace and social justice his entire life, working with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. on the Freedom Marches. He was arrested with nine others after crossing into Alabama and jailed at the Kilby Prison, where he staged a 32-day hunger strike, refusing to cooperate with an unjust system. History professor Howard Zinn wrote of Eric, 
Then one night, I was invited to a gathering place for poets, musicians, and performers of all sorts who were possessed awesome social consciousness. And there was a counter at the side of the room, and again, that sign, food, not bombs. This time, I paid more than ordinary attention, because I recognized the man behind the counter, Eric Weinberger. I had met him 25 years before, on the road from Selma to Montgomery, Alabama, in the Great Civil Rights March of 1965, and again in 1977, in another march, this time of anti-nuclear activists, into the site of the Seabrook Nuclear Power Plant. Now another dozen years had elapsed, and he was with food, not bombs. Tom Cohen's book, Three Who Dared, included a chapter about Eric that described his work with King, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and his work as a peace activist. Tom wrote that, much later, Eric discovered from his FBI file that he would have been indicted with the Chicago 8 for conspiracy to cross state Lanesto inside a riot, except that the FBI couldn't figure out where and how he crossed the Illinois state line. Unlike the others indicted, he hadn't flown to Chicago, but had driven, characteristically unnoticed, in a truck with the sound equipment. He dedicated the last two decades of his life volunteering with Boston Food, Not Bombs, he was passionate about the need for food, not bombs, to be dedicated to nonviolent social change. And he taught many new activists about the importance of including a literature table and banner at every meal. The second Food Not Bombs chapter. In 1988, Bay Area veterans for peace activist Brian Wilson helped organize the Nuremberg Action to blockade weapons shipments destined to Central America at the Concord Naval Weapons Depot. The activists sat on the tracks before each train load of weapons left the base four ships docked in the Sacramento River. One afternoon, the train didn't stop and ran over Brian, cutting off his legs. I'd met Brian at a fast for peace in Boston and went to the protest that weekend. I was so moved by Brian's dedication that I decided to start a second Food Not Bombs in San Francisco. This time, I decided to take notes on how the group started to help other people start chapters in their community. The first action for San Francisco Food Not Bombs was to provide meals to the protesters at the Nevada test site. While serving miso soup to activists blockading the nuclear workers, a group from Long Beach, California reported that they had started to collect produce and bread and were sharing meals in a local park. We heard about Food Not feeding the protesters at the Nevada test site bombs in Boston and thought the name might be copyrighted so we are calling ourselves Bread Not Bombs. We said, call yourselves Food Not Bombs and we will have three chapters, which they did. I returned to San Francisco to organize a weekly meal. It was the perfect city for Food Not Bombs, with good weather and a history of radical activism. During a meeting at a Chinese restaurant, the San Francisco activists realized there was no free meal served in the Haight-Ashbury on Mondays. So that week we set up a food table at the entrance to the Golden Gate Park, at the foot of Haight Street, there was always a nice little crowd of people sitting on the lawn, and they welcomed the free lunch and the message of peace. That July, the director of the Haight-Ashbury Soup Kitchen suggested the volunteers could get a permit from the Recreation and Parks Department office, which was a block from where we were serving. On August 15, 1988, our small group of dedicated Food Not Bombs activists was surprised when 45 riot police marched out of the woods and arrested nine volunteers for sharing food with the hungry without a permit. The police had tipped off a reporter from the San Francisco Chronicle, who filed a story and photo about riot police arresting our volunteers for feeding the hungry. People all over the Bay Area were shocked and asked if they could be of help. The next Monday, nearly 200 people joined a march down Haight Street banging pots and pans on their way to risk arrest at Golden Gate Park. The police made 29 arrests. News of these arrests made CNN, The London Times, The New York Times, and many other media outlets around the world. The next week, the police told Food Not Bombs that they didn't mind that they were feeding the hungry, it's just that they are making a political statement and that isn't allowed. The police told the media that the group could feed the hungry in an armory out at the ocean, but not in public. On Labor Day, over 1,000 people came to Golden Gate Park to risk arrest. 54 activists were jailed and a number of people were injured by the police, including a TV cameraman who was disabled for decades. Facing a crisis, Mayor Art Agnos held two afternoons of meetings with members of Food Not Bombs, the ACLU, city officials, and neighborhood activists. The H Food Not Bombs. Hungry family looks on at police blocking lunch at Golden Gate Park. Mayor issued a permit to end the arrests. So many people were inspired by the resistance of Food Not Bombs that the group not only returned to the park, but also started to share their ideas and food without police interference on Tuesdays at the Federal Building and the United Nations Plaza on Wednesdays. People in other cities wanted to know how they could get arrested sharing vegan meals, so the volunteers in San Francisco took their notes and made a flyer called Seven Steps to Starting a Local Food Not Bombs Group. New Food Not Bombs. Chapters started in Washington, D.C., New York City, Seattle, Victoria, and Vancouver, B.C., and in several other cities. All went well until the next summer, when the police started a campaign to arrest the homeless for sleeping in the city parks. One Monday, people eating at Food Not Bombs told stories about the police ordering the fire department to soak their camp and of the police taking their sleeping bags, blankets, and personal belongings. The next day, the volunteers heard more stories of police repression. The homeless started a tent city protest at Civic Center Plaza across from City Hall. On Wednesday, the hungry asked Food Not Bombs to join them in Civic Center Plaza. That evening, the volunteers started a 24-hour-a-day vegan soup kitchen in solidarity with San Francisco's homeless. The homeless organized concerts, dances, and rallies every weekday at noon. After several weeks and lots of news coverage, the Police Activities League hired a carnival to set up bumper car rides, a Ferris wheel, and other attractions in the plaza, but this didn't stop the protest, now called Tiananmen Square in solidarity with the Tiananmen Square protests in China. New York Food Not Bombs was busy feeding a Tompkins Square Park tent city protest on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. 
On the morning of the 27th day, the mayor of San Francisco opened an additional shelter, declaring that all the homeless now had a place to stay and ordered the arrest of any of the homeless unwilling to sleep in. This converted auto dealership. Riot police surrounded Civic Center Plaza as the campers rolled up their tents and packed away their belongings. For many, though, the shelter was not an option. Men had to leave their families on the streets. Women and people with pets were not allowed to stay at the new shelter. They had to bring their own cardboard box to sleep on. The police started to arrest food, not bombs again, and harassed homeless people all across the city. Mother Teresa and her organization, the Sisters of Charity, stopped their meals at Civic Center Plaza, so San Francisco Food Not Bombs decided to take their place and share food across from City Hall every day at lunch and dinner. The group organized a system where the food was divided into thirds. Several volunteers would start to share. A small amount of rice, beans, soup, and bread, and the police would make a few arrests. Then another group of all, police arrest 54 for sharing food at the east end of Golden Gate Park on Labor Day 1988. Unteers with a little more food would arrive, and they would be arrested. While the police were busy booking the people they had arrested, the rest of the food would emerge and food not bombs would feed everyone who had come to eat. After a few months of near daily arrests, the volunteers came up with a program called Risk Arrest One Day a Month with Food Not Bombs and invited members of other groups to risk arrest sharing meals. Nuns and priests were arrested, as were students, peace groups, and labor organizers, but when members of the National Lawyers Guild shared food, the police arrested the people eating and left the lawyers free. The arrests were virtually a daily event. On October 17, 1989, at 5.05 p.m., San Francisco shook with the largest earthquake since 1909. Rice and beans were cooking on the stove at the time the gas and electricity went out. Food Not Bombs still had its propane tanks and stoves from the days of the tent city protest, so the volunteers loaded up the truck and set up a field kitchen outside City Hall. This time, when the police arrived, they joined the soup line and had a bite to eat, and the arrests ended for the rest of Mayor Agnos's term. The first President Bush launched the Desert Storm, attack on Iraq on January 16, 1990, and tens of thousands of people joined the evening demonstrations in San Francisco, to be followed by blockades of interstate highways, federal buildings, the Bay Bridge, and the Pacific Stock Exchange in San Francisco. Over a million protesters filled the streets each weekend of the U.S. assault on Iraq. San Francisco Food Not Bombs shared meals across the city for 45 days, making it possible to keep the federal building. Chevron World Headquarters and other key sites shut down for days. Food Not Bombs provided meals at hundreds of protests all over the world during Desert Storm, the U.S. Congress voted for San Francisco to be the host city of the 500th anniversary of Columbus arriving. Food Not Bombs marches down Haight Street to see if the police would make more arrests. In the New World, and Chevron Oil won the right to sponsor the planned celebration. Native American activists announced they would organize a protest. Food Not Bombs called its first international gathering for October 1992 around. 75 people came to the gathering from many of the nearly 30 active groups, including several volunteers from Food Not Bombs chapters in Canada. New Society Press had asked us to write a book when they read the flyer, Seven Steps to Starting a Local Food Not Bombs Group, and the book, Food Not Bombs, How to Feed the Hungry and Build Community, was published just in time for the first gathering. The principles of Food Not Bombs were a major focus of the gathering. The activists agreed that every chapter would be autonomous, there would be no leaders, and they would use the consensus process to make decisions. They also agreed that the food would always be vegetarian and free to anyone without restriction. The third principle was a dedication to nonviolent direct action. The activists closed the gathering by agreeing to return home and help people start new chapters in neighboring cities. The next day, the Food Not Bombs volunteers cooked a huge amount of food and provided vegetarian meals to the Native American protesters, some of whom pushed Columbus back out into the San Francisco Bay. 500 years was enough. Food Not Bombs activists returned home and started organizing more meals and new chapters. Grassroots punk bands such as 15, J Church, Good Riddance, Propa, Gandhi, and MDC put information about Food Not Bombs in their lyrics and liner notes. On top of all this grassroots dissemination and organizing, the internet was just becoming popular and became a major tool for spreading the word about Food Not Bombs. Chapters started everywhere, almost like magic. Groups started in Melbourne, Australia, Prague, Czechoslovakia, Montreal, Canada, London, England, and in cities all across the United States. Not long after the Food Not Bombs 1992 gathering, there was about to be an election in San Francisco and the man who led the arrests of Food Not Bombs, Chief of Police Frank Jordan, ran for mayor on an anti-homeless platform, claiming he would round the homeless up and put them in work camps. Once elected, Jordan started what he called the Quality of Life Enforcement Matrix Program. Attorney General Janet Reno's Justice Department donated a military plane, which the city outfitted with thermal imaging cameras so the police could see the body heat of people living in the parks. The program started in August 1993 with raids throughout the city's parks. The police ordered people to throw their shoes, sleeping bags, and blankets in trash trucks. Many were arrested for sleeping in public. San Francisco's homeless were told to leave the city. Food Not Bombs volunteers were horrified to see this abuse of police power. So they joined with the San Francisco Coalition of the Homeless and other community groups in organizing protests for the human rights of people living on the streets. Food Not Bombs volunteers bore rode a video camera from the ACLU to film the human rights abuses. They filmed police confiscating shoes and an officer struggling to tear a photo album from the arms of an older woman. The activists gave the footage to the local TV stations, and Oakland's Channel 2 aired some of the shots on their evening news. This angered the mayor, and 
In retaliation, Jordan ordered the city attorney to get a restraining order against food, not bombs, sharing meals without a permit. And he ordered his Recreation and Parks Commission to delete the permit process. The courts agreed to issue an injunction, and the volunteers started being arrested and charged with felony conspiracy to share free food in violation of a court order. One morning, I made calls to the local media, inviting them to cover our protests for the rights of the homeless. But a staff person at the Bay City News Service explained that the management had posted notices claiming that it was illegal to take calls from food, not bombs, because it would be aiding and abetting in a felony. An electrical engineer, Stephen Dunifer, was starting to teach classes on building low-power FM radio transmitters. Food Not Bombs volunteers joined Stephen in making transmitters. For Free Radio Berkeley and San Francisco Liberation Radio, unlicensed, low-power, or pirate radio stations. The free radio stations reported on government efforts to make it illegal to be homeless, and police violence against Food Not Bombs volunteers. The Federal Communications Commission tried to shut down the stations, but this only encouraged more people to start their own stations. At one point, there were over 350 unlicensed, low-power FM radio stations in the United States, many started by Food Not Bombs activists. Food Not Bombs was still getting arrested almost every day and decided to add another project to its Risk Arrest One Day a Month campaign. We talked with the San Francisco Tenants Union and proposed to occupy an empty hotel across from Glide Memorial Church on Thanksgiving. The mayor's friend had evicted nearly 200 low-income people to turn his building into an expensive tourist hotel. As the mayor arrived for his televised turkey cutting at Glide Soup Kitchen, activists dropped banners saying, Homes not jails, declaring housing as a human right. That same evening, several homeless families moved into an abandoned Office A block from Glide. After the success of this first action, activists started to ride around the city writing down the addresses of empty buildings and looking up the properties at City Hall. If the properties were in litigation by banks fighting over the ownership, the volunteers would break open the building and put their own locks on them. Volunteers would ask people eating dinner with food, not bombs, if they would like a place to live. The activists would invite the homeless to meet them at 9 the next morning at the address of an empty building. The activists would arrive with a key, tools, and cleaning supplies, unlock the door, and invite the homeless families to move in. Neighbors were often happy to see the empty building occupied, not realizing that the Homes Not Jails volunteers were not really the owners. According to the book No Trespassing, Homes Not Jails had keys to over 400 houses and housed people in nearly 100 of those buildings. Homes Not Jails also organized a campaign to house homeless veterans by occupying abandoned housing in the Presidio, a former army base near the Golden Gate Bridge. The day the North American Free Trade Agreement went into effect, January 1, 1994, several Bay Area microradio stations received an email from the Zapatistas about an uprising in Mexico. That evening, San Francisco Liberation Radio broadcasted the Zapatistas' communique from the top of Twin Peaks, while Free Radio Berkeley read the manifesto from the Oakland Hills. The next day, Food Not Bombs volunteers held a Viva. Food Not Bombs banner hangs from balcony of the mayor's office in San Francisco, California. Zapatista, no NAFTA sign, as they shared their daily lunch. The mayor's film commissioner stumbled out of City Hall and started yelling at the people serving food. He took out a cell phone and called a tow truck to take away the Food Not Bombs truck. I set aside the sign and went to a payphone in City Hall to call the towing company. The film commissioner followed me to the phone booth and started pushing me against the inside of the booth. Unable to finish the call, I went upstairs to another phone booth and made arrangements to retrieve the truck. Two businessmen and a police officer stood at the bottom of the stairs and asked me to come and speak with them. Yes, how can I help you? You're under arrest for assault, battery, and strong-armed robbery. That happens to be a strike under the California Three Strikes Law. Once bailed, I continued to get arrested for sharing meals until May when I was arrested handing out literature to the Board of Supervisors. This time I was charged with assault with a deadly weapon and possession of stolen property, 284 Berkeley Farms dairy milk crates, and faced 25 years to life in prison. Our food Not Bombs becomes global, even as San Francisco Food Not Bombs volunteers were. Being arrested every day, the news inspired people all over the world to start local chapters. Volunteers who were hauled off to jail often suffered beatings and torture techniques used by the Special Operations Unit of the San Francisco Police. On a couple of occasions, plainclothes police officers took me to their office, stripped me of my clothes, lifted me by my arms and legs until my ligaments and tendons ripped, then stuffed me into a tiny stress position cage that hung from the ceiling where I stayed unable to stretch my legs straight for three days. The police also pushed volunteers to the ground during meals, beating them with clubs and flashlights, as well as choking others during their arrests. I required two surgeries after being clubbed between the eyes. Another activist was sent to the psychiatric ward at San Francisco General, tied down to a bed and drugged. The police also used pain compliance holds when arresting servers and made threats to kill volunteers if they didn't stop. Instead of stopping, Food Not Bombs spread word of this harsh repression and moved defiant activists to join the movement, starting new groups and inspiring respect from many of the people living on the streets. Things had gotten so bad that Amnesty International, in an unprecedented move, declared that all Food Not Bombs volunteers would be considered prisoners of conscience if they were convicted. The United Nations Human Rights Commission in Switzerland also started an investigation into human rights violations against the group. Robert Norse Kahn, a Food Not Bombs volunteer, was the only one of over 1,000 people arrested for sharing food that was ever convicted and was the only arrest not filmed. He was sentenced to 60 days in jail but was released after only two weeks because of a massive outpouring of support. Volunteers sharing food and literature outside the jail were interfering with business as usual, and the warden thought it was ridiculous that, with the jail overcrowded, he had to hold someone who had simply given a bagel to a homeless woman. 
I settled my three strikes case with a conviction of felony disruption of a police commission hearing in exchange for the city dropping all other charges. To stay out of the reach of the San Francisco police, I started a tour North America and Europe, promoting food, not bombs. In 1995, the Rent is Theft Tour introduced people in 50 cities to a vegan cooking demonstration set up and broadcast the program on a low-powered FM radio station and helped organize local food, not bombs, and homes, not jails chapters. In June 1995, San Francisco hosted the 50th anniversary celebration of the founding of the United Nations. A second Food Not Bombs International gathering was held with nearly 600 people registering at the Convergence Center. Every day, Food Not Bombs volunteers were arrested serving food at UN Plaza under the shadow of the obelisk honoring the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which reads, in part, everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of himself and of his family, including food, clothing, housing and medical care, and necessary social services. Several Food Not Bombs activists set up the first Indy Media Center at the Convergence Center. The gathering started with dozens of Food Not Bombs activists arrested when they built a colorful shantytown on UN Plaza to show that there are homeless people, even in the wealthiest nation on earth, while highlighting that the city had removed San Francisco's homeless from sight. Still others were arrested on felony arson charges for a nighttime march with torches against the death penalty and in support of death row inmate Mumia Abu-Jamal. During the 10-day gathering, Food Not Bombs activists from all over the world cooked together, protested together, and were jailed together. They attended workshops on consensus decision-making, banner painting, biodiesel, lard cars, building micro-FM radio transmitters, sexism and racism, compost making and cooking. In 1997, three activists from Spain, Sara, Manolo, and Salva joined Seth, a musician from Southern California, and myself on the Unfree Trade Tour. We talked about organizing against the globalization of the economy and the need to protest the North American Free Trade Agreement and the World Trade Organization. We visited 60 cities in the United States and Canada and encouraged people to shut down the WTO whenever it meets in North America, a 337-page book about the tour, Journey to the Heart of the Beast, Viaje al Corazón de la Bestia, was published in Spanish when it was announced that the WTO would meet in Seattle in November. Of 1999, Food Not Bombs chapters around North America started to mobilize, posting flyers, hosting events, and urging communities to head for the Northwest. Seattle Food Not Bombs helped secure a convergence center, joined Seeds of Peace in preparing meals for the protesters, helped set up an Indy Media office, and welcomed thousands of activists that came to Seattle to shut down the WTO in the now famous Battle of Seattle. The first decade of the 21st century saw a world in crisis, providing Food Not Bombs volunteers with many challenges. By 2000s, Food Not Bombs was worldwide and growing fast. Food Not Bombs activists were cooking for big anti-globalization actions in Europe and the Americas. Food Not Bombs celebrated its 25th anniversary with the annual Soup Stock concert in Dolores Park, San Francisco. Over 15,000 people attended the free concert that featured team musicians like Fugazi, Michael Franti, Sleater Kinney, and thousands of free vegan meals. Gothenburg, Sweden Food Not Bombs founder, Eric Westerlin, was shot and arrested during a protest in his hometown against the G8. Food Not Bombs in Australia helped free refugees from a detention center. German chapters helped organize and provide vegan meals at border camps and castor nuclear waste blockades. Chapters started in Argentina in response to the collapse of their economy. Food Not Bombs chapters joined in anti-McDonald's Day protests sharing vegan food on October 16 outside McDonald's in cities all over the world. Many Food Not Bombs groups also served free food on the annual Buy Nothing Day. The end of centralized communist power in Eastern Europe inspired an explosion of food not bombs activity in Poland, Ukraine, Serbia, Croatia, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, and Russia. Several Polish students moved to East Berlin to publish the magazine Abolish the Borders from Below, with numerous reports about the activities of food not bombs across the region. Food not bombs groups in New Zealand focused on ecological crisis caused by the consumer-based society, organizing the first really, really free market. Food not bombs' volunteer, Tony, produced a documentary on the work of food not bombs in Kuala Lumpur. Activists from food not bombs Chapters across the Philippines organized yearly gatherings. Indonesian chapters also organized their own gatherings, concerts, and built a do-it-yourself culture. Meanwhile, Knoxville Food Not Bombs coordinated the meals at the annual school of the America's Watch protests in Fort Benning, Georgia, designed to pressure the U.S. government to end the training of torturers, feeding hundreds of activists before they were arrested in civil disobedience actions. Not long after George W. Bush was placed into the White House, the world woke up to the 9-11 disaster. New Brunswick Food Not Bombs rushed to take, vegan food to the rescue workers at the Staten Island Ferry. At the same time, Food Not Bombs was providing meals to rescue workers near the site of the World Trade Center. In the months before the attack on Afghanistan, Food Not Bombs chapters provided free vegan meals to thousands of peace activists at protests all over the world. Before long, Food Not Bombs was again feeding people at the huge protests against the invasion of Iraq. Hundreds of protesters were served hot meals by Food Not Bombs in Budapest, Belgrade, Warsaw, Poznan, Amsterdam, Kuala Lumpur, Sydney, Washington, D.C., Boston, San Francisco, Los Angeles, New York. Tucson, and dozens of other cities. Along with feeding protesters, Food Not Bombs also continued to share free vegan meals with the homeless every week in hundreds of cities all over the world. 
Police attacked the Miami Convergence Center and arrested and beat several food not bombs volunteers during the demonstrations against the Free Trade Agreement of the Americas Ministerial in November 2003. Food not bombs also introduced the really, really free market to the United States at this action. Activist Starhawk remembers, I'm sitting in another gray cement walled warehouse in yet another city. Already the walls are full of signs, schedules, lists of the scarce housing resources here in Miami, of the workdays and marches and puppet fests planned for the next few days, sign up grids for staffing and security, a small pile of tarps that will be used to catch rain and to cover the serving area in the parking lot where food not bombs will feed us all. In 2004, I traveled to Europe and the Middle East, visiting local chapters, collecting, cooking, and sharing meals. When I arrived in Croatia, activists with Zagreb food not bombs, Marie Vesco shares food in Brixton, London told me about how they had provided over 1,000 meals to protesters outside the U.S. Embassy during the global days of protest against the war on Iraq. They also told me that Food Not Bombs chapters were sharing meals in six Croatian cities and suggested I visit the groups in Serbia. Belgrade Food Not Bombs told of their effort to support the protests during the NATO bombing of their city. We cooked in a house made empty by a direct hit from a U.S. missile that failed to explode but damaged the roof and passed into the basement. I traveled to Denmark and learned that Copenhagen Food Not Bombs had been given the Danish Peace Award. I visited Food Not Bombs in Slovakia, where my presentation in Bratislava was broadcast on national TV and radio. I also learned that Food Not Bombs had started animal rescue shelters in over 20 cities. Food Not Bombs chapters from towns all over Ireland brought food to Shannon Air Base to protest the war. We also discovered that many benefit Food Not Bombs CDs and videos had been created and sold to support the various chapters' actions. A group of Dutch and German Food Not Bombs activists visited four Food Not Bombs chapters in Poland and made a powerful documentary about their trip. When I traveled to Tel Aviv, I learned that food not. Bombs had been started by a group of students that had refused to join the Israeli Defense Forces. They organized a Rafusnik conference and started a chapter to provide meals to the participants. After the conference, they were invited to provide food at a two-month-long peace camp on the West Bank. During the camp, they started a group called Anarchists Against the Wall. The day I arrived in Tel Aviv, food not bombs activists and their friends were cutting through a gate in the separation wall between Palestine and Israel while being shot at with live ammunition by the Israeli Defense Forces. One of our friends, Gil, was shot and rushed to the hospital. While I was traveling in Europe, I learned that several Food Not Bombs chapters in Mexico were sharing food at an anti-globalization protest in Guadalajara. Eleven Food Not Bombs volunteers were arrested and brutally beaten at the Guadalajara protest, generating worldwide protests and calls for their freedom. The CEO founder of Food Not Bombs in Mexico disappeared for weeks in the prison system. Around that same time, Amnesty International called for the release of the nine Filipino Food Not Bombs activists arrested during a camping trip and charged with participation in a New People's Army assault on a military base. Richmond, Virginia Food Not Bombs called for an international gathering during the Republican National Convention in New York City. They worked with volunteers that cooked each week at ABC No Rio 2 or organize the logistics. The FBI visited Food Not Bombs activists in Denver, Colorado and Lawrence, Kansas, and infiltrated Richmond and New York Food Not Bombs, instigating an argument against the gathering, causing the workshops and other activities to be canceled at the last minute. Still, Food Not Bombs activists arrived to cook at St. Mark's Church, and provided hundreds of meals to the protesters. An FBI memo claimed that Food Not Bombs had 24 slingshots that could be used as wrist rocket against the police. The slingshots were copies of a paper called Slingshot, published in Berkeley, California. The ABC News program 2020 has quoted the FBI, saying that a prominent Food Not Bombs volunteer had come to destroy the city. Several of us spent three or four days jailed in the tombs after being arrested near Madison Square Garden. When the leader of Ukraine, Viktor Yanukovych, refused to accept the vote for his removal on November 21, 2004, Food Not Bombs joined the protest. Food Not Bombs volunteers set up a field kitchen outside the parliament building in Kiev. The Orange Revolution occupation forced a new runoff, giving Yanukovych's rival the victory, ending the protest with Viktor Yushchenko inauguration on January 23, 2005. In June 2005, in the days before the protest against genetically engineered organisms called Biodemocracy 2005, reclaim the commons. Food Not Bombs activists met in Philadelphia to talk about the future of the movement, but the meeting was disrupted by a number of infiltrators, including a woman named Anna, who was recruited by the FBI because of a college paper she wrote for a community college course against those protesting. Breathe and Rest team were playing with his band Sandinista. Neo-Nazis set off a time bomb before a meal in Russia. The volunteers were late, so no one was hurt. The World Trade Organization in Seattle. Anna posed as a medic at the violently repressed protest against the Free Trade Agreement of the America's Ministerial in Miami argued against the New York gathering and became friends with Philadelphia Food Not Bombs volunteer, Eric McDavid, who was sentenced to 19 years in prison after the FBI gave Anna a wired car and house, plans on how to build a bomb and blasting caps. Anna argued that Eric and his friends, Ren and Zachary, weren't really serious about saving the earth if they weren't willing to bomb a dam on the Sacramento River. When the FBI realized they would never go through with Anna's plans, they raided the house on January 13, 2006. The three Food Not Bombs activists were arrested and charged with the plot. According to journalist Jennifer Van Bergen, the affidavit, which was written by FBI Special Agent Nassen Walker, shows that the agency has identified the Earth Liberation Front ELF as a recognized eco-terrorist group, which Walker states has been involved in over $200 million worth of damage since 1997. 
The activist volunteered with food, not bombs, not with a group the FBI calls the ELF. The FBI claims that Anna has provided information that has been utilized in at least 12 separate anarchist cases and that her information has proved accurate and reliable. President George W. Bush started a six-week vacation at his ranch in Crawford, Texas in the summer of 2005 as Americans and Iraqis died in the hot Mesopotamian sun. Cindy Sheehan's son, Casey, had been killed in Iraq on April 4, 2004, and she went to Texas to ask Bush for what noble cause had her son given his life. She set up a tent outside Bush's ranch and started the protest camp Casey. A week into her vigil, she called the Food Not Bombs office in Tucson seeking support. Food Not Bombs arrived a week later, setting up a kitchen across from Cindy's tent, while providing three meals a day to thousands of protesters. Food Not Bombs volunteers learned about a huge hurricane spinning across the Gulf of Mexico. The cooks met with the Veterans for Peace activists and decided to mobilize volunteers to help with the relief effort after the hurricane passed. I posted a web page that evening asking all chapters to collect food and supplies to take to the survivors of Hurricane Katrina. Food Not Bombs chapters started to call in with offers of volunteers, busloads of food and supplies. We got reports of fundraising concerts and garages full of dry goods and clothes. A few days after New Orleans was flooded, the volunteers from Hartford Food Not Bombs arrived in their bus and set up the first kitchen. Thousands of volunteers organized food drives, gathered volunteers and drove to the Gulf region to help. Rainbow family buses and volunteers with Veterans for Peace joined the relief effort. Colleges donated the use of their vans and gave class credit to their students to volunteer with Food Not Bombs. Buddhist temples filled Food Not Bombs trucks with their emergency food. The Tucson Food Not Bombs office was flooded with calls for help after one survivor told CNN, where is the Red Cross? Where is FEMA? What we need is Food Not Bombs. New Orleans City Councilors emailed Food Not Bombs for help. The state emergency management agencies called Food Not Bombs frantic for updates. Reporters, rescue workers, police, and federal emergency management employees joined the survivors for breakfast, lunch, and dinner at the Food Not Bombs. Tucson Bus shares food with truck drivers. Food Not Bombs Kitchen at Common Grounds in New Orleans. Kitchen in New Orleans. Volunteers provided food to survivors in nearly 20 communities. The American Red Cross gave our office phone number to anyone needing food. Houston Food Not Bombs provided food outside the Red Cross Center and Theaster Dome and Convention Center. They helped Indymedia set up a low-powered FM station in the Astrodome, making it possible for families to reach one another. Criticism from the survivors broadcast through the Relief Center caused concern for the American Red Cross, who responded by shutting the station down. Eight months after Katrina, filmmaker and Food Not Bombs volunteer Helen Hill answered a loud knock on the door of her New Orleans home. An unidentified man opened fire on her and her husband Paul. She died of her wounds, leaving Paul a widow. Food Not Bombs visits farm in Nigeria. Food Not Bombs activists shared free vegan meals every week for several years in St. Petersburg, Russia, attracting a regular crowd. One afternoon in November 2005, a group of young neo-Nazis attacked the servers as they were finishing lunch. The neo-Nazi stabbed several volunteers, killing the St. Petersburg founder, Timur. His murder inspired a nationwide resistance with marches and the creation of a strong movement in inspiring the founding of groups in over 50 cities across Russia and new chapters in the Ukraine, Belarus, Lithuania, and Latvia. The neo-Nazis continued to attack food, not bombs, stabbing another volunteer to death while he was preparing food for activists at an anti-nuclear camp in Siberia. Nazis also stabbed several other volunteers in cities throughout Russia, and they set off a time bomb at the St. Petersburg meal. The volunteers were several minutes late, and no one was hurt. Russian-speaking food, not bombs groups, created a communications network, a system of websites, and coordinated actions. They organized and fed participants at marches and campaigns to protect the environment. They organized the 2007 World Gathering in Ukraine, inspiring the creation of more chapters and activities across Europe. Food Not Bombs volunteers also provided the meals to farm workers at a 600-day tent city vigil in Bosnia-Herzegovina Park in Sarajevo. Across the world, Food Not Bombs was sharing free vegan meals with striking auto workers in Seoul, South Korea. Chicago Food Not Bombs delivered meals to workers who started to occupy the Republic windows and Eric Montañez arrested in Orlando, Florida, Doors Factory in Chicago, Illinois on December 5, 2008. Food Not Bombs activists in Japan shared free vegan meals to people protesting the G8. Food Not Bombs in Holbrook, Tasmania provided food to activists defending the wilderness protesting the clear-cutting of old-growth forests. At the same time, Reykjavik Food Not Bombs was providing meals at a protest against an increase in the number of Alcoa's aluminum smelters proposed to be opened in Iceland. The global economic collapse inspired another surge of interest in Food Not Bombs. People emailed and called Food Not Bombs to tell us they were starting a new chapter, often adding that they'd experienced the impact of the housing foreclosure crisis, been laid off, or had family members struggling to survive. In March 2007, several hundred Food Not Bombs activists met in Nashville, Tennessee to discuss what local chapters could do to respond to the crisis. Ideas included helping start new chapters, adding regular meals to each group's weekly schedule, working on a campaign to make local laws to end the destruction of food in trash compactors, the creation of more homes, not jails groups, reclaiming abandoned housing for the homeless, the organizing of regular really, really free markets and the creation and the planting of more Food Not Lawns community gardens. Food Not Lawns gardens were planted in nearly 60 more communities that summer. Really, really free markets flourished after the gathering. Groups started reoccupying foreclosed homes and many more chapters started as other groups added meals to their weekly schedule. 
In April 2007, food prices increased so much that the United Nations announced that over 800,000 additional people were struggling to eat. Even wealthy countries, such as Iceland, felt the crunch. After Reykjavik Food Not Bombs provided meals to climate change protesters outside in Alcoa, Smelter, they found the numbers of people coming to their weekly meals increasing. Food Not Bombs had been sharing every week to a mystified public in central Reykjavik who told our volunteers that they could not understand why we would give away free meals when everyone was economically secure. That was until the Icelandic economy collapsed and hundreds started to lose their jobs. Soon, angry community members came to the weekly meal to eat and express their outrage at the failed system. The literature provided by Food Not Bombs encouraged discussion about the government's policies and helped inspire a weekly protest after the meal. Before long, government leaders were resigning, and the people of Iceland started a process of writing a new constitution. Food Not Bombs activists organized concerts and gatherings to celebrate the 30th anniversary of Food Not Bombs in a number of cities. I participated in a four-day gathering that ended with a concert in Monterrey, Mexico. Volunteers made a proposal that we organize a better system of intergroup communication and cooperation. Two weeks later, on May 24, 2010, I traveled to the Boston Commons where hundreds of people listened to music and attended workshops. A memorial to Boston Food Not Bombs. Food Not Bombs shares a meal in Romania. Buenos Aires Food Not Bombs shares food with their community in Argentina. Activist Eric Weinberger was set up on the commons near where he had shared meals for over 20 years. His ashes were poured on the site. Ballad of Lake Eola and people all over the world organized protests, petitions, and other actions to support an end to the arrests. Many other cities in the southeastern United States were interested in the Orlando case, wanting to implement similar laws restricting the sharing of food with the hungry. After Orlando made 24 arrests in June 2011, the other cities seemed to back off. The struggle for the right to share food continued in Florida. Orlando Food Not Bombs volunteer Eric Montanus was arrested on April 4, 2007 during dinner at Lake Eola Park, charged with violating a new large group feeding law. The law required that people and groups wanting to share meals to groups larger than 25 would have to request a permit and would be limited to sharing meals only twice a year per park. Orlando Food Not Bombs had been sharing meals twice a week at the Lake Eola picnic area for many years. I believe there are several reasons why this movement is still so strong after 30 years. Food Not Bombs has no leaders or directors, and each chapter is autonomous, making decisions involving everyone in the group, using the process of consensus. The authorities have not been able to discredit the movement by directing its attention on a charismatic leader or take it over by placing their own people into positions of leadership. Because Food Not Bombs is a task-based movement, volunteers find the work rewarding. It is very empowering to collect, prepare, and share free food all on your own and to do it with little money and few resources. Sharing food is powerful and magical. The fact that we are seeking to change society rather than participate in maintaining a system that requires charity encourages more passion and dedication. Additionally, when average people realize they have the power to make a difference, it can change their lives. Eric won a jury trial and the group took the city to federal court where a district judge ruled the law violated the group's First Amendment rights to free speech and assembly. The city hired a private law firm for $150,000 to appeal the district court ruling. The city won the, their appeal to the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals on April 12, 2011, writing, that the restrictions did not violate the U.S. Constitution. The city started making arrests again that June, jailing 24 volunteers. The arrests made news all over the world as a cyber activist with anonymous shutdown websites in protest. David Rovix wrote the, This is the foundation of social change and the authorities know it. In fact, several San Francisco Police Department memos expressed concern that if they were not able to stop food, not bombs, the public might come to believe that they could solve their own social problems and start to ignore the policies of government and corporate leaders. The self-empowerment of tens of thousands of people may be Food Not Bombs' greatest achievement. Every chapter is independent and shares the unifying principles of Food Not Bombs, a commitment to nonviolent action, sharing free vegan food with anyone without restriction, and making decisions by participatory democracy or consensus. These ideals play an important role in the success of this movement. Food Not Bombs volunteers know they are expected to participate in the decision-making process of their chapter. A manager, director, or president is not going to tell them what to do. This leads to a strong sense of responsibility for the actions of the group and pride in what they accomplish. These lessons are often spread to other kinds of community organizing efforts. Many affinity groups addressing basic human needs and social injustice have used food, not bombs, as a model for their organizing. People often note that the process used by Occupy Wall Street is similar to the model used by food, not bombs. That may be because many of the people participating in the occupations were also active with food, not bombs, or had been involved with their local chapter at some point in their past. The chaos of our economic and political system is inspiring many people to volunteer with their local food, not bombs group. Volunteers often have a close relationship with many people in the community and are trusted. We show up with our food and literature every week. Local groceries know we are reliable and will do our best to pick up their discarded food. When the occupation started, local participants knew their local food, not bombs group would help. This trust, reliability, and persistence are essential to our ability to build support for social change. Our local food, not bombs groups are generating the spirit and vision. Food Not Bombs Meal in Ponte, Indonesia needed to create a new world that can flourish while seeking solutions to the crisis of climate change, economic failure, and a corporate-dominated political system. 
Just by participating once a week, recovering food from your local bakery, or taking responsibility to set out the literature at the weekly meal, you can have a huge impact. The transformation you will experience can change your life and the lives of those touched by the activities of your Food Not Bombs group. This simple movement, started by eight students in 1980 with a vision and no money or leaders, is gently inspiring a change in society based on peace and participatory democracy, guaranteeing the rights of everyone in respect for the earth and all its beings. Food, not bombs, volunteers are eager to support the transformation of our society and work to build a world free from domination, coercion, and violence. We are demonstrating that food is a right, not a privilege, and that scarcity is a violent myth causing much unnecessary pain and suffering. Our banner proudly announces that our world needs food, not bombs. Elders talk with food, not bombs in Lagos, sharing vegan meals on the Seattle waterfront. The next 30 years of food, not bombs. The work of food, not bombs is needed now more than at any time in our 30 year history. Our steady persistence providing both tangible solutions and clear critique of the issues provides food, not bombs with the real possibility of fostering positive change over the next 30 years. The trust we have built with our communities by showing up, sharing food, and standing by our principles, even in the face of violent repression, provides us with an opportunity to provide a positive influence. The global economic, environmental, and political crises are inspiring people to seek change. Nearly a billion people go hungry each day as access to seeds and agriculture is controlled by fewer and fewer transnational corporations. As the cost of food increases, forcing low-income people to spend ever larger percentage of their wages to feed their families. Governments, corporations, religious leaders, and gangs are relying on the use of violence to enforce these policies of resource scarcity. Total military spending in the United States continues to take over 50 cents of every tax dollar paid by individuals. Military spending by the U.S. is equal to half of all spending in preparation for war, resources that could be used by these countries to reduce hunger and poverty. Military spending is not only draining resources, but represents the many damaging policies that rob our communities of vital programs such as education and healthcare. While your county may not be the world's leading arms merchant, policymakers are often making decisions that are not in the best interest of everyone who will be affected. Building a strong food, not bombs movement is one effective way to help all groups that are organizing against corporate domination. It is also a good way to reach people that would not otherwise know about actions like the occupations or efforts to end hunger, poverty, and war. We are out in the public square talking to people that are often strangers to the many issues we are organizing around. Food Not Bombs is active in over 1,000 cities around the world and often the most visible project accessible to the mainstream. There are a number of areas we could work towards. One is to increase our visibility by making sure we always have banners and literature at every meal. Food Not Bombs chapters might consider if they are sharing their meals at the best location or could adjust the time or day of their meals to reach the most people. We could also establish a more reliable system of intergroup communication and coordination among chapters in a region, state, or country. Another improvement to make our communication more effective is to add an agenda item where all emails, phone calls, and other communications with your group are discussed. Food, not bombs groups are often invited to support strikes, occupations, and other actions, but we can also initiate protests and invite others to support our actions. The next 30 years of food, not bombs could be critical. Each chapter could increase its ability to make decisions using consensus, and stronger, more effective systems of inter-chapter communication and coordination could provide the foundation for the transformation of our society. When I wrote the first draft of this book in 2009, I included this vision of what food, not bombs could do in the future. Imagine if food, not bombs organized tent city protests outside city halls in all 1,000 communities. A couple of years after I wrote that we might want to dream big and help organize occupations, Food Not Bombs was already realizing that goal. On September 17, 2011, hundreds of people arrived at Wall Street in New York City responding to Adbuster Magazine's call to Occupy. In preparation for the occupation, Food Not Bombs volunteers participated in the General Assemblies. Those participating agreed to make decisions using consensus, decided to have no leaders, and adopted the principles of nonviolence. Even after the first wave of evictions in 2011, I still believe the strategy that long-term occupations of public space is sound, and I encourage people to consider adjustments to minimize the authority's ability to covertly disrupt this powerful method of nonviolent direct action. I went on to suggest that we plant food, not lawns, organic gardens in the grass at each tent city protest, with a message that all the vacant lots be used to grow organic food for the community could inspire a revolution in food. As it turned out, I was also getting ahead of myself. Food, not lawns, gardens were cultivated at Occupy Miami and other more temperate occupations. I also suggested that solar and wind-powered FM radio stations at all 1,000 occupations could make sure news of the action was impossible to ignore. It turned out that live-streaming the occupations was also effective. Food Not Bombs could help organize other coordinated actions to inspire communities to adopt programs like those described in the Transition Town Handbook and the programs like Democracy Schools started by the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund. That too happened as the occupations continued to evolve. While I noted that, Many of the principles practiced by Food Not Bombs were adopted by the people that occupied the squares of the Arab world, bringing an end to one dictator after another. I didn't realize events would change so quickly. Many of the principles practiced by Food Not Bombs were also adopted by Occupy Wall Street. General assemblies, used a form of the consensus process, were dedicated to taking nonviolent direct action and made their food available to everyone. 
Just like food, not bombs, the occupation has no leaders or headquarters. The occupations reclaim public space and seek to make fundamental changes in the economic and political system. The exploitation by the unelected wealthy at a time when food prices were causing hunger was more than people could take. To regain our dignity, millions of us started to occupy the streets and public squares, challenging the political and economic power of repressive governments all over the world. The occupations of 2011 could be the initial step in the journey towards a post-capitalist society based on compassion and mutual aid. Food, not bombs, can provide food and logistical support for a number of trends growing out of the occupations. At times, the community might be facing a state or province-wide policy that could be harmful, and all the food not bombs groups in that area could coordinate a regional campaign using our ability to provide food and other logistics. Just as we saw in 2011, food not bombs might find itself feeding protests all over the globe. Instead of acting as a charity, we are feeding the movement to end the policies that cause poverty and hunger. At the same time, people who wouldn't eat otherwise can enjoy a healthy meal made with love. Most food not bombs groups have deep roots in their local community and are respected by people with diverse backgrounds providing a unique set of possibilities that many other organizations can only hope to have. This provides food, not bombs, with the possibility of organizing towards a compassionate future, both locally and globally at the same time. With all the urgent crises facing our communities, we would be irresponsible if we didn't take advantage of these strengths and work to build a more reliable system of intergroup communications and develop a more effective means to coordinate our activities among groups so we can organize regional and global actions. Now that we know that the occupations can have a powerful impact, we can build on that and take nonviolent direct action to even more powerful levels. We can experiment with new ways of applying pressure while introducing solutions to social crisis caused by a political and economic system of exploitation. The institutions responsible for the crisis need to adjust to our influence. Evictions from public space or foreclosed homes are not acceptable in a future that understands that dignity. Compassion and concern for our environment are always of greater value than profits and corporate domination of the government and society. The next 30 years could be crucial to building a free and sustainable future. You are encouraged to help us make the changes we need. D. Preparing okra for the food, not bombs dinner in Orlando, Florida.